hopefully you'll recognise this image. Um, George Lucas's um, film, Revenge of the Sith, uh, Star Wars, uh, the episode three, the prequel, uh, which I watched again last night just to kind of refresh my memory. I've seen it about four or five times. So. But um, I'm going to talk about this piece really in the kind of context of the book I've chosen. It's like this uh, it's really hard to think of an artwork or a film or, or a book that, you know, has had a profound influence on my non-practice, I'm not an artist. So uh, I, I, do, I, be, I do a bit of everything. I, I do some writing, uh, usually sort of polemical, controversial stuff around uh, art and freedom of expression, um, the state of cultural life in, in kind of civic society. Uh, and, uh, and then yeah, I rant a lot on Facebook and social media. So um, if people follow me, they'll, they'll probably know that. Um, uh, so the book I decided to choose, which I feel encapsulates my interest and, uh, and someone who I admire very much is uh, Camille Puglia uh, and this book called Glittering Images, which uh, is subtitled A Journey Through Arts from Egypt to Star Wars. And uh, the reason I chose this is that she's kind of, well, firstly, I think she's one of, uh, uh, one of our greatest public intellectuals that we have at the moment. And also, she's, uh, she describes herself as a dissident feminist. Uh, so she's incredibly critical of contemporary feminism. And also incredibly critical, um, not incredibly, but actually brilliantly critical of uh, how uh, academia within the arts and humanities and uh, the art schools is becoming uh, dominated by kind of heavy theorised uh, uh, post-structuralist, Marxist, feminist, queer theory kind of uh, um, uh, uh, ideas and, and how that kind of, in a sense, limits the appreciation of, uh, of art. And uh, what I, this book was published not so long ago, it was published in 2012, and uh, it's utterly readable. It's only 200 pages. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a kind of continuation, really, of some of the kind of great, kind of readable books around art history. So E.M. Gombrich's The Story of Art, um, or Kenneth Clark's um, a brilliant um, 1969 BBC documentary, Civilization. Um, so there were kind of personal journeys, and, and I kind of really felt engrossed by this book. Because, I mean, one thing about, I don't know if anyone's seen Camille Parker speak on uh, interviews, She's incredibly energetic, she's a motor mouth, she's, she's a loud mouth, and she's opinionated. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, uh, and, and she writes that way too, so this book is really kind of a dizzy, giddy um, voyage really. Uh, immensely readable and enjoyable um, journey through the history of art, as told through um, uh, Pavia's uh, 29 selection of images. So she starts with... Um, uh, Egyptian art, actually, as it says there in the subtitle, um, and um, with this amazing image um, of uh, Queen uh, Nefertari and the goddess Isis, not to be confused with Islamic State, um, <laughs> and uh, it's a brilliant picture of the two, of, uh, of the, the queen uh, with the goddess um, being sort of taken to the, to the, uh, the, the, the afterworld, and that's in 1290, 1224 BC, and it's, it's just a, a fantastic uh, image, um, incredibly sensuous. Um, it's kind of a wonderful kind of bond, bonding between two women, female figures. And then just the detail. And, uh, and I think what uh, Pugli is really good at is to say, you know, ignore the theory. Ignore the, the highfalutin, obtuse academia that's uh, uh, in the appreciation of art. Um, and just look at it historically, but kind of pick the works that kind of uh, responds to you. Um, but also, um, she asks us really to observe, and to really look at the detail of work, and to read the work very much uh, in and of itself, uh, and to judge it um, as such. So, um, so she chooses about 29 images, uh, and they're quite eclectic, very eclectic, starting from um, uh, moving on through art history to um, uh, Greek art, um, wonderful sculpture, the charity of uh, Delphi. Um, moving on to, uh, uh, again, um, uh, this one, which is uh, Lacan's, and his, uh, his son's been snared by uh, serpents. And there's something quite heroic about quite a lot of her images. 
And, uh, but she's not uh, unlike um, you know, sort of Brian Sewell and people like that, other critics. She's not, she's not anti-contemporary art, but she's very selective about what she likes. Um, so she kind of controversially says about um, uh, Revenge of the Sith um, that um, uh, it's probably um, one of the greatest works of the 21st century. <laughs> so she asks, uh, uh, she says that, you know, who is the greatest artist of our time? And, uh, and she says, normally we'd look to literature and the fine arts to make that judgment. Uh, but pop art's happy marriage to commercial mass media marks the end of an era. The supreme artists of the half century following Jackson Pollock were not painters, but innovators who had embraced technology. And she refers to the wider culture of Lindemar Bergman's film, Bob Dylan moving from folk music to electric. Um, and, um, and she says that the decades that, the kind of decade that's bridging the 20th and 21st century, we're kind of seeing uh, the fine arts and the visual arts kind of shrink to some sort of insignificance. And that only one cultural figure has had the pioneering boldness and world impact that we associate with the early masters of avant-garde modernism. George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> the epic filmmaker who turns dazzling new technology into expressive personal genre. So, I think it's quite a bold and very controversial statement to make, but actually, when I think about what my kind of uh, uh, daily appreciation of culture and art, it's, it is very much uh, uh, box setting, looking at Netflix, devouring Battlestar Galactica, devouring Buffy the Vampire Slayer, <laughs> uh, devouring the, the Star Wars uh, uh, saga. And, uh, and I occasionally go to art exhibitions and I do quite a lot as part of my job. And, uh, and I write about art a bit and I, uh, not as much as Fism, uh, but, uh, uh, and, and I kind of uh, have an opinion. And, um, and I think like, like Pugley, I don't come from an art background. I don't, I've, I've dabbled in a bit of painting, got an O-level art. And, uh, but my main love was literature, and, and she's her, her, her doctorate. She's a doctor of uh, uh, she her doctorate is English lit. Um, so I kind of see a sort of um, maybe not as great as Carmel Pugley, but you know sort of similar tr uh, territory in that we're both kind of interdisciplinary in how we work and how we think about stuff. Um, and um, and I like her polemical and provocations um, when she kind of speaks about this um, and. Um, and as I said, you know, she's not anti-modern arts. You know, so the book uh, refers to Picasso's uh, Les Dem Demoiselles d'Avignon, um, George Gross's work, but also sort of other controversial ones. Um, uh, one artist, I must quickly look for it, um, of the 20th century. Um, you probably have, or once in your youth, probably have posters of, of um, Tamara de Lempica's uh, uh, pain, paintings on the wall. You know, it's a kind of... Uh, every kind of tortured, uh, romantic uh, uh, individual teenager might have had that as an Athena poster. And, uh, you know, she's, a, she's an artist that's probably quite ridiculed in the kind of contemporary modern art world. Um, uh, you know, her, her, her images kind of uh, adorn the uh, front covers of Iron Man novels and, um, uh, and you know, the, the bedroom walls that said sort of you know, tortured individualists. Um, but so again, you know, what uh, um, Pablo says about Lempica is that um, though she was one of the most strong-willed and fantastically industrious women artists of the 20th century, her work can be seen in few museums outside of France. Most of her paintings are privately owned, often by movie stars, uh, which has compromised her reputation among art critics. Performers identify with the theatricality of her portraits, uh, which confer glamour and status in contrast, and this is where she really pulls no punches, the favourite woman artist of mainstream feminism is Frida Kahlo. Because of her folkloric themes, her militant com communism, her marital humiliations, and her ailments, accidents, and surgeries, which she graphically detailed in grisly paintings of symbolic martyrdom. So that's uh, uh, how she kind of hits pretty much uh, uh, with, uh, with no. Uh, uh, Subtlety. But also she, she, she looks at other great artists, uh, Magritte, Mondrian, Pollock, Andy Warhol, but also lesser known artists such as the, the African-American painter uh, John Wesley Hardrick who painted these beautiful um, um, portraits of uh, black people um, in urban kind of uh, contexts, you know, so the kind of jazz age 
of, uh, of, of the sort of flappers and stuff. And it was really elegant uh, paintings. But also, uh, she talks about um, 60s arts and 70s onwards, you know, performance and installation. And uh, another uh, Jamaican Caribbean artist called Rene Cox. Uh, and this amazing image uh, called Chilling with Liberty, where the artist, uh, um, very sort of Cindy Sherman esque, uh, um, sits uh, as a photocopied uh, image of her on the Statue of Liberty. But there's this sort of wonderful idea of you know, a, a kind of contemplation of freedom and liberty. And, um, and I think, you know, uh, for, for a dissident feminist like Pavia to include Renee Cox uh, in, in the book, uh, where she's kind of riffing the superhero uh, Wonder Woman, uh, but also wearing the, uh, a costume cut from the Jamaican flag, you know, it really does call into question about how far we achieved um, our ideas and notions of freedom or liberty. So I'm going to finish there and put the case of Muslim Star Wars. Um, it is a fantastic piece of work, and I would say technically a masterful work of innovation, captures the universal narratives of, uh, of humankind.